just like there are highways for cars, routes for aircraft are established across the whole planet. These routes are a bunch of GPS coordinates and direct lines connecting those coordinates. It is these lines that the aircraft follow with their own navigation equipment when they're going from airport A to airport B. Those coordinates in the airways have been given individual names just because it's more convenient to use a short name instead of a long coordinate number series. As an example, here's what the pilots would follow if they were approaching the capital of Finland, Helsinki, from the north. They would be following an airway called Yankee 86 to a coordinate called Lucet. Since there are these airways everywhere and the pilots have everything programmed into their aircraft flight management system and the autopilot does all the hard work, why does the aircraft controller start annoying the pilots by telling them to turn left here or turn right there? That will take the aircraft out of these routes and at the same time increases the workload of the pilots. What the controller starts doing is called vectoring. And to find out why flying without vectoring is extremely dangerous, watch until the end of this video. Imagine driving on the highway without anything stopping or disturbing your travel. This is how most of the flight happens as the aircraft is just following those airways, passing the coordinate points one by one. When you're about to reach the city, you come across traffic signals and lights to make the traffic flow more smoothly and safely for drivers and pedestrians. The closer you get to the city, the more cars you get, crossroads, and traffic regulations. The same happens when airplanes fly airborne highways to airports with many planes simultaneously approaching the same airport. That's one common scenario where you need vectoring, a complex traffic light system that allows airplanes to travel under strict conditions. At the end of this video, we'll show you exactly how this happens. To learn more about ATC, check out our other videos on the channel. For now, back to the main topic. Even though the 21st century, the world still didn't come up with a better navigation tool than a compass. Don't get me wrong, a compass rocks. 10 centuries ago, it helped ships navigate the sea. Now, it helps us navigate aircraft. Hopefully, you already know what a compass is, a device that shows the cardinal directions used for navigation and geographic orientation. The basic compass consists of a magnetized needle, compass card, or compass rose, which can navigate to align itself with magnetic north. Today, we use gyroscopes, magnometers, and GPS receivers. The four cardinal directions are the four main compass directions, north, south, east, and west, commonly denoted by their initials N, S, E, and W, respectively. Relative to the north, the directions east, south, and west are at 90 degree intervals in the clockwise direction. Now, let's take a look at how these degrees work in vectoring. The north, east, west, and south are represented by 360, 090, 180, and 270. In this example, we have an aircraft flying directly towards the north, which is, as you all know by this point, heading 360. If we want the aircraft to turn this way, it would be heading to 090. The controller would say, turn right heading 090. Using only the cardinal directions wouldn't be very precise and efficient, so we usually use any heading with increments of 5. So when we want the same aircraft to turn this way, turn left heading 300, then here, turn left heading 255, and so on. I'm pretty sure you get the point. It takes a second or two for the pilot to react to your instructions and for the aircraft to complete the desired turn. The time varies based on the aircraft type and its speed. A fighter jet turns in a snap, whereas a fully loaded huge cargo freighter takes a lot of time to reach the new heading. Now let's cover real life situations where vectoring is used. Number one, in route controller example number one. One thing ATC can't control is the weather. Sometimes a huge thunderstorm blocks the sky all the way so high that the airplanes are not able to climb over it. Sometimes this storm is right in the middle of an airway and the only way to solve this is to vector the traffic around the storm. Another thing that can block airways is an active military area, other aircraft activity like flying training area or weather observation equipment launched from the ground. Vectoring is the only treatment in these situations. Number two, in route controller example number two. The following typical scenario occurs at many busy airports every single day. 
Many flights are about to arrive at the same airport and airways into the common place where only one aircraft can enter at the same time. Unlike cars at high traffic lights, airplanes suck at stopping mid-air for their turn. So the ATC guy has to decide which one goes first and who should head away. Depending on how much distance is needed between the flights, that second flight flies in the wrong direction for some time before the controller instructs the flight to turn back towards the airport behind the other aircraft. Number 3. Approach Radar Controller Example 1 Continuing from the previous scenario, sequencing the traffic toward the airport might not be enough. Once those two aircraft come inbound in a single file, like an Orient Express, a similar scenario can await the airport approach controller on the other side, no matter how busy the airport is. And still, only one aircraft at a time can land on the runway. So for all these flights not to crash while turning to the final approach towards the runway, something must be done. This is when the controllers use the so-called aerodrome traffic circuit. Usually, we want to use the runway so that both the takeoffs and landings occur towards headwind. The opposite direction on both sides of the runway is called the downwind. For managing the arriving traffic, the approach controller wants to get the traffic positioned on both downwind, where every flight has its own space and number in the arrival sequence. You could think of this as a zipper-like motion. When the flight next in sequence is in a correct position to be turned towards the next traffic circuit segment, the base leg, there is room for them and not another airplane just opposite of them competing to be number one. Once the number one is turned to the final segment of the circuit, the next flight will be turned to the base leg. This pattern gives each flight a clear order when it's their turn and enough space between them so that there's no risk of collision. In busy airports, this zipper motion can continue for several hours. If you want to see it in action, go to FlightRadar24.com, scroll to any major airport, grab some popcorn, and enjoy the show. Number 4. Approach Radar Controller Example 2 In some cases, an airport departure radar controller is handling traffic not just from one, but two or even more airports. In this case, there may be situations where two aircraft can take off simultaneously from adjacent airports and head toward the same airway. This scenario is like the second example that we had earlier, but reversed. Now the departure controller chooses from those flights which will be the first to enter the airway and by some vectoring, creates enough space for the second one. The result should be for all the traffic to start their journey on the airway nice and tidy in a single file with at least a minimum separation between them. Want to practice vectoring yourself? Check out the description in this video for tools to become a vectoring champion. Do you still have questions left? Let us know in the comment section below. And this was just scratching the surface of vectoring and controlling the traffic. To learn more, make sure to like and subscribe so you can enjoy the excellent content we send your way.